seconds. There we go. And we're live. So welcome, everyone. Thanks all for being here. I am back with Chris at Speaker's Corner, although clearly not at Speaker's Corner today. But <laughs> thanks, Chris, for joining me. And uh, how are things with you? Yeah, doing really well, Lloyd. Thanks for having me back. I really do like our, uh, our live sessions where we get to go through some stuff. Well, and, thank uh, you. It's been, it's been great. Um, yeah, no, it's, I appreciate having the chance to, to speak with you about these things. Um, I, had, I had Eric and Connie um, who are on the Cross and Crescent discussion group, and she runs her own channel, Small Clips Apologetics. And I'm having them again this weekend because they do some great apologetics. Eric has some great arguments. He's retired now, so he is starting to do some some research. He's spending time committed to to developing his apologetics and his polemics, which is great. And uh, yeah, we've he and I've had some some very good conversations, and uh, looking forward to that as well. So welcome, Century Since and Nina, Mikhail, Thunderous. Good evening, Thunderous. Let's do something on Sunday, this Sunday. Um, so six p.m. your time, seven p.m. mine. Let's do that on Sunday, Thunderous. And um, yeah, Romeo, Dr. Mutaman, and uh, yeah, thanks all for being here. So yeah, Chris, um, you have a regular, sorry, what was that? <laughs> I'll just say that, his name. <laughs> I wasn't prepared for that. Got like yeah, PhD, yeah, TA. well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> PhD, THD, ED, MD, so yeah, well, I, <clears throat> I guess he knows what he's on about. So yeah, and Century Since, welcome. Um, yeah. So you you have a rig, you have a um, a discussion group and you guys go through polemics and apologetics. You obviously do an analysis like feedback of your experiences at Speakers Corner, and then you you discuss ways, I guess, of um, of how to to counter these. What kind of arguments do you use? Can you tell me a bit about that? And for the audience, because I'm assuming that the Muslim polemics they ebb and sway, but also they 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 evolve. Oh yeah, absolutely. So as part of what we do at Speakers Corner. We find it quite beneficial to off well, I say offline, away from speakers corner, usually remote. Mm -hmm. We have a weekly meeting where we just analyze some of the things that we heard that week on the Sunday. Uh, speakers corner happens every Sunday. And we just go through some of the <laughs> to be brash nonsense things that the Dawa guys have been saying. And we just analyze it. We just think about what is the best response we can give and how can we think about it polemically? How can we defend the Christian faith? And how can we ultimately turn it? around and be like, hey, you guys are not following the true religion. You are in the truth. You are actually, if anything, acting more like a cult and you need to turn away from that and repent of that and come back to Lord Jesus Christ. So that's kind of what we focus on. Uh, and we go through different material every week and yeah, it's, it's quite casual, so. Right, yeah, I was very happy to be invited the, the one week, the first time I was on and it's a very, very interesting crew. You guys do some so so what has come out of this meeting um what are, what are common patterns you see within the dawa that muslims are using and are there levels of dawa gandists are they like skilled guys are they cannon fodder you know is there something in between yeah. that's a really interesting question um so there are trolls i guess is the best way of putting it so you know like you have a youtube and you have the comment section and you can see people that are just obvious trolls they just copy paste the same thing well those people actually are real in the sense that they do the same thing, basically, at Speaker's Corner in person. Uh, I'm going to name mm -hmm. drop Suraj here. There is a particular Muslim uh, Dawagandist called Suraj. And he's, he's this quite uh, short guy who is Somalian. And his whole role is basically just to do damage cover. So if a Christian speaks to a Muslim and the Christian is explaining, hey, um, do you guys know that Muhammad had sex with Aisha when she was nine years old? Or... Hey, did you guys know that Allah doesn't love the non-believers? You know, we go through some, some mm -hmm. of these common points. He will literally intrude and get in front of people and yell and scream at them. And he would, you can just follow, like watch him like running around, like going to different Christian groups and trying to disrupt them as much as he can. That's one level that you'll see. Uh, Siraj is kind of the best at it. <laughs> yeah, uh, that guy. Uh, yeah. So... He, um, he's been escorted out of the park many times for violent behavior as well. Uh, really? David at Speaker's Corner made that point. Yeah, he, he calls him tiny criminal uh, because he, he's, uh, yeah, he's been escorted out of the park on many occasions by the police. But he still keeps yeah, coming. No one that about it. Is someone that is pre-violent, or one of the terms you can use is someone who's pre-violent. They're not mm. directly violent, but they, they're in those stages prior. And... There's, there's intent 
Yeah, he's he's the sort of guy that will get very physical and touchy. Uh, and the more upset and emotional he gets, you know, his arms start going in the air and he starts like using his shoulders to to butt into people. Um, that kind of thing. And then if it escalates, he'll escalate with it. I was uh, talking so with someone. Mm. Yeah, sorry. Go no, on. go on, Lois. No, I was just going to, you had the point. No, I was talking with someone today, you know, the incident in Germany, which was very unfortunate for, for many reasons, but someone, Michael Sturzenberger of the AFD was attacked. Now, of course, oh, yes, if yeah. only, if, if only Christians weren't Christians, they wouldn't get killed by Muslims, right? If, if only we wouldn't do things on YouTube to discuss Islam from authentic Islamic sources, we wouldn't get, get injured and hurt and insulted and and so and 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 right if if only um someone rishi didn't write that book he wouldn't have gotten stabbed in the eye just need to shut if, up if and, uh, and be quiet that's what that's what i think yeah yeah if, if if yeah. only we you know if, if only those 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 um people at the christmas market in germany hadn't gone to a disgusting evil christmas market they wouldn't have had that truck driven over them you know if only those people hadn't gone to that concert, they wouldn't have had a bomb go off in it, you know? So, I mean, if, if only we hadn't done these things. So we clearly incited, we clearly incited these people, which is, which is, you know, we, we probably have to grovel and apologize for that. But, but also the, with, with the AFD, the Muslim was stabbing people and one of the AFD members grabbed him, managed to restrain him, got him on the ground and stopped him from stabbing people. So the police obviously jumped in and said, hey, oh, my God, there's that evil, nasty German white man who is suppressing a Muslim. Oh, my God, let me rescue the Muslims. So he pulled the evil white man off of the Muslim stabber and, you know, started arresting him on the ground. So the Muslim got up and stabbed the policeman in the neck several times. And he has since died, which uh, which just yeah. tells you the state of of it just tells you the, the state of where we are today. in the West. It, It's kind of the thing where. Like part of you thinks, you know, how foolish can you be? You see someone who's holding someone who, I, I mean, I don't know. I guess, I guess maybe he just made a judgment call and got it incredibly wrong. Um, I, I find it difficult to see how he could have done that, but evidently so. Um, and, and when I saw the knife and the knife go into his neck, because I saw that it went into his neck and it, and he lasted for a few seconds, I immediately thought there's a high likelihood he's going to die from that. Um, just from watching it, because I, like, I know the news, well, from what I've heard of the news, supposedly he died from it, the police officer who was stabbed yes, in the yes. Um I remember before hearing that, when I saw the footage, I thought, yeah, there's because you don't, with a knife like that, I don't know, maybe you probably know more than me, Lloyd, but I don't think, uh, if you give someone time to go at you with a knife in the neck, like, I think there's a good chance you're in uh, some serious things. 90% where, where I come from, and this is something, I mean, this is something that I, I work with, I would say semi-professionally. Um, one one of the major, because most most attackers will be right-handed and they'll be attacking the left side of your neck. That is one of the things that one of the major things that you cover. And ninety percent of victims die from stab wounds generally to this side of the body, largely to the neck. From they exsanguinate, they bleed out. So this is the major target that you have to protect. So yeah. this is a, and I mean you've got the external carotids, you've got the internal. You know, got your jugglers and so on. It's 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 a really bad target to hit, and it's very you can't stitch it up, you can't heal it. it you can compress, but but you know, it's it's a problem. It's a serious problem. Hmm. So yeah, that's that's very unfortunate. And, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I mean, uh, this is something we saw. It, they they tried to stab Hartoon, and it's good grief. It's a miracle that she survived. She clearly wasn't meant to. To be taken from the earth that day, and I, I hope they Absolutely. catch that. Guy. I, I think um, she, she has been an instrument of the Lord for for a long time, and I think on that day she, in particular, was. There's video of her after being the victim of a stabbing attack. The guy tried to stab her. I think he think he was aiming. I think maybe just at the face. I don't know if he had any because all all of the um, all the footage shows he was either aiming at the face or maybe the neck, and he just missed. I missed, saw that he looked at the, the thing is they get into a bit of a frenzy. Um, look, the guy from the AFD, Michael Sturzenberger, he was stabbed in the head and face. If you look at what happened to Father Marmari, head and face, right? Same with uh, same with others. That, that's that's the Quran, exactly. Quran eight twelve. That's why the neck stab, you know, stab yeah. because it is it's designed to take you from this life, right? That's the whole point of attacking that particular target. 
Um, so yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, so this is a very unfortunate. Um, you said you were saying that there were multiple levels of apologists. So you get the trolls who are yes. there to intimidate and threaten. Yep. Um, so I'd be the number one of that. Um, just I saw in a comment someone said the cucumber guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of. He's also one. Um, but to be honest with you, he's actually, and I'm being honest here, I think he's not well. Um, but he is violent. But isn't it always violent. the case? They claim that, you know, well, once they do something weird, it's like they're mentally unwell. I mean, the newspaper reports were were policemen killed at far right rally. As if right, someone right. in the far right killed him. I mean, holy, yeah, holy the, moly. I mean, the, the, <laughs> you know, that was, that's what that's I not hate. an accurate headline. Yeah, I mean, that's that's when you know that you're coming from an ideological perspective, right? You you care more about how you phrase the truth than just saying the truth. Um, and that's when you should stop reading those kind of news headlines, to be honest, because they're just they're just lying to you, to your face. Yeah. Um, um, what was yeah. I going to say? Oh, uh, yeah, so the, the reason why I say this is, yeah, the, the cucumber guy. Um, he's, he's this old guy who I think is from, like, Afghanistan originally. He comes to Speaker's Corner. He's called Street Mike the N-word, and that's one of his favorite words to yell out. Um, he has been violent before, so we shouldn't be at the corner. But, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, he's, he's, just, he's just a peculiar type. Um, but, yeah, you could say he's kind of trollish, but he, he usually stays to his own self. Um, I'm just going to go through some comments. Is that all right? Because some people have asked sure, questions. Sure, please go ahead. Yeah. So is Hatton Tash still coming to Speaker's Corner? Uh, no. Um, Hatton Tash, to our knowledge, is, is safe and well. She has started making videos on her channel again, so that's a really good sign. I think that she is just laying low for the time being, basically. And I think we haven't seen the end of her. I do think that she'll come to Speaker's Corner again. It's just going to be a little while before that happens. I think That's people don't realize she's had multiple attempts on her life. That wasn't the only one. She's yeah. had several attempts on her life. She's had several near successful attempts. I think there's, I mean, I don't know for sure, but I think there's probably more that she hasn't made public. Um, you know, I can't prove that or anything, but it wouldn't surprise me given what she does that there have been I'm aware of a few that, that have her. occurred that, that haven't really been spoken about. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to go into anything. Um, but yeah, I'm just aware that she, uh, she lives a very hard life, I think. Um, and she chooses to do it and Lord willing, she has been incredibly successful at bringing Muslims out of the cult of Islam and to Lord Jesus Christ. Well, she did strike one of the hardest blows against Islam in recent years. I mean, one of the most significant was revealing those 24 Qurans on that video with Jay Smith. Yep. That was that was a huge thing. I think that was like worldwide in a sense, um, yeah. because it was just so phenomenal. And also the, the way people reacted to it, the way Muslims reacted to seeing that they were like trying to grab them. And what people um, might not have seen is Jay Smith was leaving after this with the Qurans, and Muslims are trying to grab the Qurans off him and, yeah. and like steal them. <laughs> they wanted to steal Qurans because they were like, "Hey, people can't know about this." <laughs> yeah, so it's... weird. It's crazy. Actually, you know what? While we're here, there's something that I could... Uh, hold on. Now that I'm thinking, now that you just made me think of this, is this here? You know, uh, Jewish, you just made me think of something. Um, I just got to find the page where I put it now. It's... Uh, could, oh, here. Probably here. Let me see. Um, ah, found it. You know, you just made me think of something, Chris, and something that, that I think is worth talking about. It's a, it's a direction I want to go. Um, it's time. Let me just share my screen, share my screen, the entire screen, Bob's, there you go. And, oh, what did I just do? Add to stage, Bob's your uncle. There you go. You got it. Nice. Talking about those Quranic differences. Now, I know someone who is very knowledgeable of this particular topic is Jai or Jay. He occasionally much, goes on Eric's yeah. channel. He's extremely knowledgeable because he speaks Arabic. And of course, Muslims are like, you can't Islam properly because you don't speak Arabic. And you, and of course, Jay says, well, well, I'm a, I'm a native Arab speaker. No, but you're a dirty Arab. I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> so, <laughs> which is like, okay, I meet the criteria. But so yeah, the goalpost could move. But notice, this is one example. Um, Quranic differences. This is Quran 1016. I'm just going to bring this page up larger. And... Um, Everyone can see one that. Of my favorite ones. Yeah. 
Now, now this is with uh, Eunice, which is Jonah. Now, notice this is, I know it's hard to see for the audience. My apologies. It's a little hard to see. This is a Quran version called Abdul, Abdul Manan Omar. Okay. And this is 10, 16. Oh, God, what did I just do to myself? I made a wrong mistake. Uh, I need to fix this. There we go. <laughs> and then this is a different Quran version, Aziz Ahmed. I'm assuming these are legitimate because Muslims are putting these out for the public to view, right? So these are two. So this is called the EnglishQuran.com, and you can do Quran side by side. Now they speak of the different Kira'at, or just it's tomato versus tomato, but it's still tomato, T O M A T O. Except, no, when you see potato versus tomato, those are not the same thing. Or when you see rabbit and tomato, those are not dialectical differences. Those are different things entirely. But notice, notice in this Quran, 1016, say, had Allah so willed that he should replace the teachings of the Quran with some other teachings, I would not have recited this Quran to you, nor would he have made it known to you. Okay? Let's go to verse 16 in this Quran. But when our evident signs or revelations are recited to them, those who expect not the meeting with us say, bring a lecture, the Quran, other than this or change it. It is not for me to change it of my own accord. That's exactly the same verse, right? Chris, 1016 and 1016. Wait, Am I correct? Whoa, that's totally different. Totally different. Yes. Isn't that, isn't that unusual? And that's because, but, ah, there we go. Yeah, yeah, it's a bismillah. That's what you go on. <laughs> I'm jumping ahead. Go on, go on. No, please go on. Wow, thank you very much, Razor. Very it's, grateful. And look, for, for those who, who for those who donate to the channel, many of you just do so for without leaving any comments. And I'm very grateful. And thank you for that. Um, it's very, very much appreciated. And by the way, Chris is linked in the um, description box and in the, the title. So please visit his channel. Thank you very much, Razor. Yeah, you were saying, please, please, Chris, tell us more. So I've seen this before. Now, it's actually really common with Ahmadiyya Muslims because their Quran uh, does include the Bismillah in all of the chapters, as far as I'm aware. So it right. basically, it knocks the verse order by one. And I think that might be what has happened here because you can see quite clearly... On the left hand side, verse 16 says, say had Allah so willed. But and on the other, 17. on the one on the right, it's 17 say had Allah willed. Right. So that's exactly the problem. Now they cannot come to a consensus as to whether the Bismillah is included or not, because the Quran is unchanged word for word, dot for dot, comma for comma, <laughs> and letter for letter. Right. And then on top of this, there are other versions of the Quran. So it says here in 16, 10, 16, okay, had Allah so willed. Okay, nor would he have made it known to you, right? So notice, it says here, had Allah willed, I would not have recited it to you. Had Allah willed, right? He, had Allah willed, he, he would replace. Hold on, hold on. Had Allah willed, I would not have recited it to you, nor would he have made it known to you. Had Allah so willed, he should replace the teachings. I should not have recited this Quran to you. Now, sorry, now not in this version, nor would he have made it known to you. In other versions of the Quran, 10.16 has a not. He would not have made it known to you. And in other versions, it says he would have made it known to you. They actually contradict each other with, with the not. So there's a negation. So now you have a contradiction in the Quran because some versions have a not. I would not have done it. And others says I would have done it. Is that a contradiction? Really cool thing for that. Oh, yeah? I, I think it is. Yeah, like it's negation, right? It's like the biggest form of contradiction. If I say my name is Chris and then I say, in the same context, my name is not Chris. That is literally, <laughs> that is the biggest and clearest case of contradiction you could possibly have. I'm telling you one thing, and then in the same context, I'm actually negating what I just said. Yep. It's a direct so, contradiction. So I'll bring up some of those examples the next time I do a talk on the Quranic differences. So now you've actually literally got contradictions, and um, Jay actually has a bunch of them. I've got a few of them, but um, I hope to do some more talks on that and then just highlight some of these critical differences that are that are clearly where the Qurans are contradictory across different translations and versions. So I, yeah, you were going to bring um, up something? Yeah, well, I want to bring up, um, I'm just going to, if I can do it Go super ahead. quick. Go ahead. Uh, which hopefully I can, just one second. What am I looking at? This one. Uh, I might, can I share my screen if that's cool? Very sure, yeah, go for it. I should catch it. Okay. So it's, it's, it's the same thing, but it's just a little bit more clear. Um, and yeah, I yeah. want people to know that. Oh, don't want to play. There it, it. is. Yeah. 
I like how it's paused with me just with my hands in the air. Oh, Father but, um, Salim, I, he's very good. He's got the Bridges Quran, right? Yeah. So this guy is a guy who works for a Dawa Institute in Cairo, in Egypt, called the Bridges Foundation. So he <laughs> he owns his own institute that does Dawa worldwide. He does a lot of stuff in America where he tries to convince Americans that Muslims um, from the East that follow Islam do not in any sense pose a threat. That's one of his mi main mission goals. But he also happens to be someone who has studied the Qur'an, art, the different readings of the Qur'an, or as you should mm -hmm. probably think of it, just different Qur'ans, because they're different. Right. They call so them the readings, they're actually variants. They're, they're different Qur'ans, yes. Exactly, exactly that. They're variants. And when you have different variants, and they're all supposedly Qur'an, perfectly preserved, Qurans, right? Yeah, perfectly preserved. Let's see if you guys can find this. What's really cool is um, this, this is actually his material that we're going through. It's not mine. I didn't put this together. He did. And this is the same uh, verse, Surah Yunus, uh, Surah 10, Ayah 16, that, um, that Lloyd, you just brought up. But what's cool is that he's got them side by side, and he actually shows the Arabic. And you can actually okay. look and see exactly where the Arabic differs. It's right at the end with the short vowel at the top of the last word. Remember, the Arabic goes from right to left. So you need to look at the very left word of that red, uh, the red highlighted part. If you look above it, you can see there's like, um, I think it's like a lion and then a little squiggly circle thing instead on one of them. And that's all the difference. And that simple difference produces an, a negation. So on the top one, you have, had a lot of world, I would have not read it to you. And he would have informed you about it. And then again, had a lot of world, I would not have read it to you. And he would have informed you about it. The through someone else bit is not actually in the Arabic. Fidel actually added that because he felt the need to clarify the Quran, because the Quran is not perfectly clear. Um, but yeah, like it's, it's things like these and there are a ton of these as well. Uh, we went through some others. Um, we could look at some of those, but yeah, right. it's, um, this is, this is the kind of thing that you're dealing with the guys when they say the killer is just dialects. No, it isn't. It changes context. It changes who's speaking. It changes whether something is or something isn't. It changes like historical accounts, like whether or not someone did something or they didn't do something. And that's quite substantial if you're claiming your text has been perfectly preserved. Yeah. In fact, there's the one example where, which I showed last time that where it says that you should feed a poor person or you should feed poor people. Now, in yep. terms of theology and practice, if it's one person, great. But what if it's poor people? Then you, are, which one of those is the correct theology? Because if you have to feed many people to get blessings, and you only feed one, then you are then you actually are remiss in your duties. You haven't met your requirements. Whereas if you feed multiples, then you're good to go. Allah will accept that. But if you violate the religion, then Allah does not accept that. So is it one or is it many? Is it one poor person or many poor people? We we don't know. By the way, I've added the Bridges Quran to the. Uh, I've dropped it in the chat now three times. So have a look. That's a download oh. link. On I have a really my... cool thing I can do. Uh, wait wait wait. It's going to be yeah. super cool here. Um, if we show this, and if actually no, I don't know. I guess some people are they're going to be on their phones, right? So they won't have access to um, to a QR code that they can scan. I'll put it oh, here. I was going to show, show it anyway, so that at least later on they can come back to it. And uh, let's add it to the stage. So yeah, so this is um, a QR code to the Bridges translation of the Ten Kula of the Noble Quran which is the book we're referring to, which is just a Quran translation where wherever there are variants or the Qur'a, they highlight it in red and then the footnotes that explain what the differences are and what different Qur'a say instead. Right. Um, and also, you guys probably have a phone, but oh well. Yeah, I've also dropped the link in the chat. So guys, I've dropped it in the link, mul the link in the chat multiple times. It's on my Google archive. You can get it there. Um, let me also show this. Um, Actually, let me fix this. I need to animate this one, fade. And Bob is now my uncle. So let me double check. Z five. Okay. Yeah. Very British phrase. Bob is now your uncle. Well, I come from South Africa, right? We're a former British colony. Because ah, personally, nice, nice, nice. I, I fully disagree that Bob is now my aunt. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so this is so guys, there's a link here to Samuel Green. You can easily find this online. Uh, Samuel Green, different Arabic versions of the Quran, PDF, right? You can find this. And he writes here, in this edition of the Quran, Muhammad Fad Karum has collected accepted variant readings from among the 10 accepted readers. Or is it the 14? Or is it the 25? Or is it the 
you know, th that's the question we haven't settled yet, and included them in the margin of the 1924 Egyptian Standard Edition of the Hafs, right? These are not all the variants. There are other variants that could have been included, but the author has limited himself to the variants of the 10 accepted readers. As the title of his book suggests, this makes it easy to know what the variant readings are because they are clearly listed. So he lists them here in the margin. Below is a page from this reference Quran. You can see the variant readings listed in the margin. Approximately two thirds of the verses of the Quran have some type of accepted variant, two thirds. This is approximately 4,000 accepted variants. That's interesting. <laughs> That's within the known Kira'at, right? So they're listing all the variants here. And let's have a quick look at the next slide. Below is a six-volume encyclopedia set which records all known variants. It is entitled Mujam al-Kira'at al-Karaniya Maqadima fi Kira'at wa al-Ashar al-Qura. The encyclopedia of the Quranic readings with an introduction to readings and famous readers. So this is an encyclopedia set in Islam in Arabic, which lists all the known variants from all the Kira'at, because they don't exist. Hey, you know what's a good way of looking at this? This is basically just uh, an Islamic scholar writing about all the different Quran variants, and that's what it looks like. It's a, it's a six-volume set explaining all the Quran variants. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> this is not you could just phrase it as... The same. Sorry. Yeah, you could just frame yeah. it as, hey, there was this Islamic scholar guy who wrote about all the Quran variants, and it's it's this six volume, it's this image. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I mean, so guys, screen cap, by all means, knock yourselves out, please. Um, yeah, so this is a six volume set. So look up Samuel Green, the different Arabic versions of the Quran. And um, yeah, just um, Samuel Green, just look, look that up and show people this. Right. Also, what few people realize is when the when the Quran was um, when Al Azhar wrote their version of the Quran, which took seventeen years, as we mentioned before, they didn't consult a single old manuscript, not one. They consulted tradition. They consulted the Hafs. But as as we highlighted, as people may not be aware, um, I covered this previously. But there are multiple versions of Hafs. Mm. There are multiple versions of Hafs. And there is still debate as to which version of Hafs is the correct one. There are four versions of Hafs that are known. Four versions. Which of the Hafs versions is the correct one? So Al Ashar just said, well, bugger that. We'll just pick this one. And there you go. That's your Quran today. They consulted no old Qurans. They didn't have some guy reciting it while they wrote it down. What does that tell us? It tells us that the way they do this is. Uh... Is sketchy as, as hell. Um, and it doesn't rely on a scientific method. It doesn't rely on looking at manuscripts. It's like, it, it's this dependency on a tradition of orality, really, I guess, rather than written texts. But they don't even get the orality right. How can you have four different ways that someone supposedly said something? How does that right. make sense? So they, they want you to believe that Hafs and Asim was basically... His own had he had his own recitation, but then for fun he varied it up a bit, and he gave it in four different ways. Why? That's just incredibly confusing. I, I don't believe that for yeah. a second. Yeah, and uh, Zacchaeus says, "Alhamdulillah, all ham to Allah." Lloyd, ready to take the Shah Na Na. When will I get my seventy-two-year-old virgin? <laughs> Um, the Shah Na Na. Good night, sweetheart. Yeah, it's time to go home. Do, do, do. So, yeah, so you better take your Shah Na Na with Bowser, okay? Because that, that's the only way to do this. I don't know if you guys remember the Shah Na <laughs> Oh, man, Shah Na Na. Back, that, was, that was back in the 70s, if I recall. <laughs> I'm showing my age. Oh, my golly. <laughs> Oh boy, um, yeah. So six volume set. So that that's a little bit of a problem there for these guys. Also, here's the thing um, with apologetics. They're always like, "Well, I'm going to consult a scholar." Why aren't the scholars in the park? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's some um, there's some interesting stuff there. <laughs> there isn't anyone. Well, the, 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 there are shakes. There are shakes at Speaker's Corner. Um, the are supposed to be men of knowledge, but when you question them, it falls apart very, very, very quickly. Right. They're not really knowledgeable. They might know they might know things like 
the differences between the Maliki school and the Hanbali school regarding certain issues. But when you talk about things that actually matter, um, then they don't know anything because they they have to go along with the theological party line. The Quran is perfectly preserved. Okay, we can't prove that. In fact, all the evidence says it isn't. But we have to keep telling Muslims this because we've been saying it for decades now. So right. if anyone asks you about it, just obfuscate, make something up, or walk away. And that's what the sheikhs. There's a Sheikh Muhammad who's quite a frequent guy, um, and he wears all the attire. Um, he runs away from everyone now. Uh, there's another Sheikh that seems a bit more involved, but he doesn't seem to know anything. He spent most of his time a few weeks ago talking with David about why um, I think he tried to justify, it, in his view, why it's acceptable for his own daughter to marry a man if she was only nine years old. You know, these kind of things. Um, it's quite laughable, really, to be completely honest with you. Yeah. Is there anything we should show anyone quickly out of the Bridges Quran? Yep. If you bring up um, what I'm showing now, wait, let me like double, let's make it bigger. Yeah. Put it I'll drop the link in the chat again just so everyone can get a copy of the Bridges. Uh, yeah, I'll do that now. Cool. So this is something I'm I'm actually putting together to do a presentation on, so you guys get, you know, uh, an early look at it. But here are some of the ones that I think are some of the most profound. Now I haven't gone through everything. Uh, there's still room for others, and there are others uh, that I'm perfectly aware of. But I've just included mm -hmm. ones that I think are substantial. Um, and we can go through them on, on the channel and the app, the the PDF file you've got of the British translation if you want. But it's just something that you guys can take and you can look at in your own time and understand, wow, actually, yeah, there are differences. And now with that Bridges translation, you can show people it. You can say, look, it comes from a guy called Fadal Soliman, who was a dawah guy. <laughs> you know, this is a Muslim that we're quoting here who has done this. Uh, so like his he, well, what's his angle then? What's his angle? Why, why is he revealing this, this, the, this, um, these mismatches? I don't really know. I mean, he, he, agrees, he agrees that it's a problem when I spoke to him. He said, yes, Chris, it is a problem that most Muslims think there is only one reading of the Quran, as he would put it. He, he thinks that really it should be known that there's actually 10. And he, in his view, the Quran just like it makes everything more beautiful and more profound because it just gives ways in which you can understand and read the Quran that don't contradict and they don't say something different, at least not in a way that's problematic. He would just say, you can take all these different things and you can just merge them together. You can just take, remember the Surah 10, Ayah 16 we showed earlier, where it said yeah, how yeah. Allah would inform them or he wouldn't inform them in a different Quran. Yeah. Well, in his view, you can just merge them and say both. Um, I don't think you can. I think that is basically accepting that you have contradictions and your way of dealing with it is just doubling down and saying, yeah, it's all good. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, look, that's, look that's at this. This is... This is a random page in the Bridges, Quran 7, 113. Is there a reward for us if we are overcomers? Surely there is a reward for us. The one is a question, the other is a statement. Yeah, this is quite this is common as well. Surely there is. Uh, is there? The one yeah. voices doubt, the other one voices certainty. And that's for yeah, changing it, one letter. Exactly that. They're it's in if you look at the Arabic, it's incredibly minor. You don't need to know Arabic just to look at them side by side and say, oh, all that's different is this tiny little mark at the end or in the middle. And that changes quite profound what the actual meaning of the sentence is. Let me see if I can find another example. Um, yeah, I, I haven't gone through this, to be honest. I haven't really spent any time on this. Well, I, I can give you some if you want to go to some. Um, yeah, yeah, you do that. Yeah. 102. <laughs> I think that's a powerful one, 17102. Uh, when, when you uh, go through the, the PDF file, look, uh, it should say the name of the surah and a number when you go through it. Yeah, I see it, 15. I'm just looking it up because it's so I've got a 17. really tiny text on some of them. 102, right? 17. So yeah, 17 and then verse 102. Yeah, let me bring that up here. Okay, so... so if you have emotionally we, oh, wait, wait. known... Just, just one thing. The the English that he has written this Quran in is based off the Hafs reading. So what you're reading here is the Hafs Quran, the Hafs Quran. So it said, he said, you have most surely known that none sent these down except the Lord of the heavens and the earth. Now, if you scroll down to the bottom of the page, yeah. So he'll have a letter. Just he'll have a letter reference. You see, you've got S G 
and you've got B here. So for the for the audience, just make a note of these letters that you will see with the red text, because the red text is your indicator, and then you go down here, you'll have B. Yeah, so al Kasai read it as, he said, I have most surely known. Now let's go back up. So remember, I have most surely known is one Quran, what one Quran says. He said, you have most surely known. Well, hang on a second. Who's speaking? So in the context here, it's a conversation between Moses and Pharaoh. So who's he talking to, Moses or Pharaoh? Because I and you are radically different. If I said, I have eaten a cake, and I said, you have eaten a cake, I'm referring to two different people. It can't also be me, right? If, right. if I said, you are watching this video, it's very different than if I said, I am watching this video. No, yeah, you, you, you stole the, the money. I stole the money. That's radically a completely, different. yeah, those are radically different things. And and these index because they're called like indexical changes. They're everywhere. Like there's there's quite a lot of cases where you have these. And most and Muslim scholars have to argue who's speaking here. And they have to say, well, when the Quran is telling you what happened historically, because remember, this is quoting someone. The Quran is quoting what either Moses or Pharaoh said. But who said it? Who's being addressed? Well, yeah, you know, also you just <laughs> Slightly off topic, sorry about that. You just, because man, I, I get, you know, when I'm talking with people, I suddenly get these little, these, uh, yeah, these little insights and associations. So al Kasai, you notice it was the 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 writer al Kasai who said, right, in his version of the Quran. Now, al Kasai <clears throat> is a very early heresy. al Kasai is one of the very earliest, most, most well-organized, anti-Christian heresies or so the story of a book revealed or sent down from heaven by a massive angel. Now, when you read the Hadiths, right, Aisha tells of a very large angel, Jibril, and she says that when Jibril first appeared to Muhammad, Jibril was so large that his shoulders covered the sky, he covered the horizon, right? And in the story of al Qasai, a massive angel who covered the sky, who was miles tall and miles wide, right, gave a book, he sent down a book to al Chasai, right, it's, it's spelled differently depending on who you find, and the story is taken from Parthia, northern Iran, which is close to Iraq, right, and Hadith writers borrowed local myths, so the book of al Chasai, al Chasaios, al Qasai, al Qasaios, al Zai, al Qasites, al Qasites, it's a lost prophetic text, it's a Jewish apocalypse from Babylonia, from about a hundred and, it's about the second, early second century, end of the first century, beginning of the second century, written during the reign of Emperor Trajan. It contains law and apocalyptic prophecies pertaining to Messianic, Jewish, pagan, and Gnostic doctrines. It is known from early Christian writings, and they mention it only in the context of heresies, and they promised remission of sins to all those who listened to the readings of the book and believed in it. And Epiphanius explains the origin of the name al to be Aramaic, Hayil Kesai, meaning the hidden power or the hidden imam. Interesting. Wow, I have not heard of that before. That is. Uh, it goes much uh, deeper than I've just explained. It, it's really involved. This parallels Islam crazily. Yeah, I, I can see the parallels immediately. It's, mm, that is interesting. That's something for me to dig into. Wow, thank you. I wish I knew how to pronounce that name. <laughs> <laughs> we know more about Islam than Allah. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful. Very deeply grateful. Thank you. Yeah. So, so yeah, this is now this, I've, I will come back to this. I've done this before and I, I, I'm busy collecting notes on this. I've been working on this for a couple of years because it's very detailed, very complex, trying to put it all together. But this heresy just sounds like Islam from the first, late first, early second century. Hmm. It's extremely unusual. And also notice they rejected the apostle Paul entirely. Their book had come down from heaven. It was sent down. Their book was sent down. And notice, outward denial of one's faith is permitted, provided that one only denies with the lips and not in one's heart. Does any of this sound familiar, Chris? Yeah, it really, really does. That is interesting. See? Quran 16, 106, one who is forced to renounce his religion while his heart is secure in faith. It made So it made selective use of the 
Old Testament and the Gospels. So that's interesting. Yes. So it did it did affirm the validity of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because it made selective use of them. The, the reason I'm asking is um is uh because Muslims basically try and look for the original Islam, like because they believe that you know you had Isa, the prophet Isa, who is our version of Jesus, but nowhere near as good. Yeah. They basically say, well, from him, some variant of Islam survived, like in some minority group, and then this is what they're referring to when the Quran tells the Christians to read the Injil and to read the Torah. It's the original ones. But um, I'm just thinking, well, if this if this group still affirmed the Gospels in some sense, even very selectively, then it cannot mm -hmm. be. Because, yeah, the, the book came, that came down from heaven is a totally separate book. But yeah, it's just interesting. Uh, interesting. It's stuff, really, right? but I mean, look, if people are in error, they're just going to, the error will just compound. But the parallels are amazing in this particular history. It's so unknown. This is one of the very, very rarely known, little known historical heretical sects, but they had a very well developed theology and they were a threat. In fact, uh, the question was here if Lloyd and Chris did the Book of Alchesai in, also include the Gospel of Ebionites? The answer to that is no, I believe. However, they did influence multiple different groups. So notice here the Ebionites are the Nasarians equal the Alchesites. One of these fragments contains a cryptogram which, reading outwards from the middle word and inverting the order of the letters, produces an Aramaic formula, right? Which presupposes readers who understood Aramaic. So it is probable that the book in its original form was written in Aramaic, right? It is not possible to decide whether al was his own name or a nickname. It was disseminated amongst other religious groups, Jewish and Jewish Christian, the Jewish Nasarians. Now, this is something that is, um, these Nasarians are a heretical Christian Messianic, Jewish Messia Messianic sect, but they're heretical. So they are sort of Jewish Messianic Jews, but heretical, right? And notice Judeo-Christian Ebionites. So they didn't include that, but it, it was their book. They were supposedly. And for this, Epiphanius once again affords evidence, right, in heresies. And the influence of the Alchesites upon Mani, as we now know from the Cologne Mani Codex, must have been considerable. Down to his 24th year, Mani lived in an Alchesite community, and his independent teaching developed in controversy with this Baptist group. So they influenced the Manichaeans. The Manichaeans definitely influenced Muhammad. Yeah. Hopefully that answers the question. There's a lot here, Chris. There's a heck of a lot in this history. If you'd like, maybe we can do this one day. I mean, this is a this th this is the closest parallel I've come to Islam, and and few people know this history. Hmm. Yeah, it, it's interesting because um, yeah, Muslims try and abuse these kind of groups. They'll be like, oh, um, you know, maybe maybe the Quran isn't referring to Trinitarian Christians. The Quran is referring to Ebionites or Manichaeans or, or some yep. other group, and I'll try and give different possible solutions. But um, to my understanding, anyway, it can't be the Ebionites as they understand it, because the Ebionites denied the virgin birth, for example. So I think that, yeah, which to me just kind of proves the point that Muhammad got confused and he was referring, he heard stories from other groups like the Ebionites, um, or maybe like some dis descendant after them, and he incorporated it into the Quran without knowing what he's actually incorporating. That'd be my guess, right. anyway. Yeah, no, they, they, clearly he didn't know. Clearly he was getting sort of some sort of uh, oral transmission, and he was not aware of the other facts. Because you look in the ninth century when the um, when these Muslims eventually settled in Spain, they actually started reading the Bible, and that's when you find that the polemics against Saint Paul really pick up pace, and that's when you find that the story changes in Islam because they've actually now actually come across a full Bible, read it, and realized that they've been talking absolute nonsense about the Bible for centuries, right? And yeah. so I've, done, I've covered that in my polemics series, where you see the, the narrative changes in the 10th century, because suddenly they come across an actual Bible and realize, oops, we made a mistake. And that's when the tahrif claims come in, and that's which started earlier, but the whole tahrif, the Bible's misinterpreted, the Bible's corrupted, those claims really pick up steam then. Yeah. Um, we were going to do some stuff on, um, oh gosh, let me just find it again. Yeah, uh, those books that I sent to you, your thoughts on those, on um, those DDAT books, let me just bring them up. Um, yeah, sure thing. Um, yeah, Ahmed Dida is interesting. He's an interesting character. I haven't had time to go through 
all well most of his stuff to be honest what i do hear though is i sort of hear it second hand regurgitated in either a, the same form or slightly different form depending on what's um what the muslim dara teams have kind of done to adapt to things but um lloyd can you scroll down a bit because i find the introduction on this thing hilarious no please go <laughs> right, yeah, wait, wait, no, no. go yeah. go, go to the top it's just it's just the second half of the the top image oh there you go so oh. <laughs> bible thumpers christians like the jehovah's witnesses who harass muslims in their own homes you see this is kind of like a massive self owen if you're gonna put out material that critiques groups at least understand what the group is <laughs> right that would be like me like saying gosh i'm so sick of those christian mormons <laughs> i'm so sick of those what? christian unitarians and the christian arian it's in the christian you know well, oh. <laughs> have you listened to a guy called Paul Williams, oh, he yeah. says exactly yeah, the same things. He says, you know, Christians like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons, you know, they you're like, um, you see, he knows I, better. That's the thing. So he, yes. he does it intentionally. Very much a charlatan, very much a charlatan, Paul Williams. Yeah, um, no, exactly. So, I mean, he's a liar. He won't face anyone. I've invited him multiple times. I've tagged him on Twitter. I've tagged him on YouTube. I've uh, left comments ad nauseum to say, hey, look, Paul, let's let's have a conversation. You know, let's talk about this Sharia that you claim to know that, you know. Um... I, I, to be honest with you, the way I frame it now is that I think many people who are Dabagandists, Muslim missionaries, to, to use their somewhat terminology, mm -hmm. I would say, yeah, they, they, they are predators because they prey on those who are weak and vulnerable. They only yeah. go for people who are new in the faith. And for people who have never been to Speaker's Corner before and then visitors and they get cameras and they, they record it and they edit it post the fact to make them look bad. It's, to be honest with you, it's quite, yeah, yeah. It's, it's quite disturbing and, and horrible that they do that. Yeah. Can we go through these different, um, just show people these, um, uh, hold on, I need to also yeah, find sure. version two. Let me just get this version two thing. Uh, somehow I closed it accidentally. Uh, here we go. Bring that up. Can we go through? Oh, it's somehow it's put them in different PDFs. Okay, that's why. Let me see if I can. There we go. That's that's mo better already. Um, shall we quickly go through some of these just to show people some of these these um, these Ahmad Didat issues? Um, what did yeah, you take cool. from this? I know you had a brief look at it, so we didn't really have a, a in depth dive. But I thought just to familiarize people with the quality of or the lack of or the lack thereof in terms of these polemics that, that are still sometimes present today. But also, if these were true then and they're not true now, you know, then then Muslims have to admit they've been lying. If they suddenly have switched polemics and this is no longer true, then Ahmad Dida must then be 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 shown to be a liar. But then you have to remember the first rule of doing Dawah, which is never admit that you're wrong about something ever. You'll never see you'll never see them admit that. Um, they always have like it's very important for them how they are perceived. They have to be perceived as being powerful, you know, as being knowledgeable, as being wise, as being intelligent. It's all an image thing for them. Uh, right. And this is why when you talk to them, they just don't shut up. <laughs> they just keep yeah. going on and on because they know what they're saying isn't good, if not just flat out wrong. But they feel as if if they say it enough and with enough words and they keep going on, then you'll believe it. And that's the right. that's the point. Very yeah, fair enough. Yeah. So Paul, full of cunning and guile. Okay, that's great. Sons of God. God has them by the tons in the Bible. Okay. Thanks, Ahmed. Let's have a quick look at, for example, incest. Wow. So he brings this yeah. up as one of the very first things he wants to discuss. So now, I can. Me, I can yeah. mm. Go on. I, I was just going to say. Um, I can kind of categorize these because you can put them into categories very easy and just kind of. Um, aggregate them all. So what you could say for this is Bible contains embarrassing thing about prophets. That's basically what that comes under. And yeah. it's very simple to refute. It's it's them trying to make Christians feel embarrassed by being like, look, here's a bad thing that your Bible talks about. Therefore, your Bible is somehow endorsing it, or it's not possibly true because it's describing a prophet as doing something like having uh, sex with someone who he's related to, and a prophet would never do that. So let's focus on that last bit first. We as Christians don't believe that prophets are sinless. 
We believe that only God is sinless and Christ is God in flesh and hence he is the only one who is sinless. So for us, it's not an issue when we hear the Bible portraying people as they really are, you know, as the, the mm. old Oliver Cromwell uh, quotes, you know, show me warts and all, show me things as they really are, as human beings who, though they are prophets uh, sent by God, they are still fallible. They can still make mistakes. Bad things can still happen to them. But Muslims, because of their doctrine, and they have the doctrine of Isma, which basically means that all the prophets in Islam are sinless, which, as you can imagine, is really bizarre, given that the Quran yeah. in multiple places says that, actually, you know, they sin all the time. The Quran tells you that Noah sinned, Abraham sinned, Muhammad sinned, uh, Moses sinned. It, it, it tells you everyone sins, but they have a, doc a doctrine that says no one sinned. <laughs> Which is crazy. And also the Quran yeah. is prescriptive. It is law. Whereas for Christianity, in Christianity, the Bible is not a book of law, as in it's not civil law. It's moral law, but it is not prescriptive. It is descriptive. It is history. It is poetry. It is narrative stories. It is a variety of genres. Whereas the Quran is supposedly the speech of Allah. And therefore, yeah. it is prescriptive upon Muslims. These are completely different genres of, of book. So this is religion of law versus religion which does not prescribe civil law. Prescribes That's a moral a really good point. Muslims will look at things like Numbers 31, 18, uh, 1 Samuel 15, 3, and they will basically say, hey, this is the Bible telling you to go out and kill people. <laughs> it's like, no, it's not prescriptive, it's descriptive. And you have to then explain, just as Lloyd has just done, the difference between the two, because Muslims, they aren't ever told the truth or encouraged to question things. They're just given a script and they just have to recite it, uh, which is really right. sad. Yeah. So, so this is scripted for the audience. Then have a look here. I'll, I'll show you a couple of things. He speaks of this. So again, for those who've seen this before, you'll know this. For those who haven't, everything is in the description box. You can download all of these, all of these references. It's in the description box, or I put it in the chat. It is available in the archive, my Google archive. Just look for it, download it. Um, so for instance, the combat kit. Notice Muslims are going to war here. Combat kit by Ahmad Didat. Right? So they called it the so, jihad kit. They missed <laughs> yeah, a trick well, though. So I'm going to excuse my French here, but um, so he speaks of here, chapter three, absurdities in the book of God and the Holy Bible. Absurdities, right? He speaks here of... Uh, I guess you guys can all read, so I don't have to explain this to you, right? Now, notice he says here, to eat S and drink P. Two Kings, 1827 and Isaiah 36, 12. Chris, does he anywhere explain the context? Does he say anything, or is this literally the entirety of the entry? Is this an index <laughs> entry, or is this the actual content? This this is um, this is them giving no context at all. In fact, I'm convinced that Ahmed did that has never read the Bible. He's basically gone through, um, perhaps with the aid of a computer or something, and just typed in certain words, a bit like how you control F, and he just types in the word incest, or he types in certain words, and then he just finds a quote, and then he just quote mines, which is very disingenuous. No context will be here. And again, to be honest with you, I, I, I tripped up immediately over the title. If you, if you scroll up slightly, where we see the, the title of these lists that he's listing, he says absurdities. In the book. Okay, so first of all, if you think that a miracle is absurd, I don't know what you're doing in Islam. I think that's a really weird thing to believe. If you think that God cannot in some way bring about a miracle, something that cannot occur naturally but is supernatural in origin, as theists we believe that, and you think that that's absurd, then you've just you've just destroyed Islam. But again, right. you'll tend to, oh, and this is kind of um, I don't I mean this somewhat tongue in cheek. <laughs> You'll tend to find that the way that the Dawagandists argue is they argue very much like in a suicide bomber kind of way. They they will they will just they would rather destroy their entire religion if they can get a point across against Christianity. They would they'll they deny would their own sources and to win they, they would deny their so all the scholars, you know, they'll deny each other. Like the, the amount of times I've said, look, people at the speaker's corner. Um, Muhammad Ijab, Mansour, they've talked about perfect preservation of the Quran. Are you going to tell me they're now wrong? And they will go, yep, bye-bye, Mansour, bye-bye, yep, throw them under the bus, they're all wrong. You know, throw the Quran under the bus, throw the Sunnah under the bus, throw the Tafsirs under the bus. My weird liberal interpretation of Islam is correct. And they do it often because 
that's basically how to be a Muslim in the West. You just throw everything know, under the bus. This reminds me of Javad Hashmi, who lies through his teeth about Christianity and then makes up his own personal, private, friendly, fuzzy, warm, happy version of Islam. Like, we should care about what he thinks of Islam. In my version of Islam, there is no child marriage because because that's all false and I don't believe it. And like, okay, it's like, great. So some people don't believe in gravity. Does that make them, you know, there are scientists who believe the earth is flat. Does, does that make their opinion particularly valid? No offense to the flat earthers out there. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I mean, exactly. But this is it. This is what Ahmadita was teaching back in the day. He gives literally no context, and he just says, "This is what the Bible teaches." He doesn't well, I mean, state, you, for you instance, can... hmm. yeah? "You finish your point, and then I'll add something." No, he doesn't state that, for instance, this was a war where the Jews were encircled in a city that were besieged for months, and the enemy, the king that had sent his general to 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 force them to kill them or force them to surrender had told them, I'm going to starve you to death. You will have nothing to eat but your own, he's insulting them, but your own pee and your own poo, right? This is not about God saying, hey, guys, um, this stuff tastes great. So, but this is what he's implying. I'm it's a history to it's you a guys. description. It's a description of a situation of desperation where the enemy was insulting them. How is this God's, I mean, this is a, this is a twisting and corruption of God's word. If... I mean, this is not even remotely honest by Ahmad Dida. He was a liar through and through. Uh, absolutely, yeah. I, th the only way you can believe that they come up with this is they were blind as they as they came, as they wrote it. Um, it's either that or they're lying, and I think they're lying. So another point as well is um, you can play the same game with the Quran. Like if you believe the Quran doesn't contain anything that perhaps some would think is absurd or immoral or weird or anything like that. I know, of course, there are tons of things. Surah sixty five, ayah four literally says that it's permissible for you to uh to divorce a prepubescent child that's what it says yeah. like to me i think that's more than absurd i think that's immoral um surah 33 is the most bizarre thing you'll read i think it's in surah 33 and perhaps surah 53 where it talks about how muhammad as revelation got the command to tell people to leave his house because they were spending too much time there talking to him and not to speak to his wives behind a curtain. I mean, the, this is the chapter Surah one hundred and eleven is hilarious. Surah one hundred eleven. Okay, can I bring this up? Because um, sure, go ahead. I, I don't want to go too much of a tangent, but this is just my favorite thing. But just I go on tangents all the time. So if go you, ahead. If you really want to say, "Hey, it contains absurd things, therefore it must be wrong," then please explain to me what on earth this is doing in your Quran, and just explain what on earth this is. Okay, uh, do you see this? You want to bring this up? If you click on that. Sure. Yeah. Cool, cool. Okay, this is Surah 111. All right, let's just read what this is about. It's very quick. It's only a few verses long. This is how it starts, right? So no prior context, nothing. May the hands of Abu Lahab. Who's Abu Lahab? No idea. Be ruined, and ruined is he. Okay, so that guy's a bad guy. Okay, fine. His wealth will not avail him or that of which he gained. Okay, so his wealth won't help him. Okay, fine. He will enter to burn in a fire of blazing flame. Okay, he's going to burn. Okay. And his wife as well, the carrier of firewood. Okay, so Abu Lahab and his wife are going to be burning, and his wife is the carrier of firewood. Okay. Around her neck is a rope of twisted fiber. Okay, that's nice. That's the end. It never explains to you what that's about. It never does anything with that at all. It's basically just a chapter in the Quran that may as well be titled Screw Abu Lahab because that's all it is. It's just <laughs> condemning this random guy and his wife to hellfire for something that is not explained. That's that's the epitome of bizarre. Um, there are tons of things in the Quran that are never explained, never given context to. And when you read it, you think, what on earth is that doing in a book that is supposedly revelation by Allah? Why does Allah care that Abu Lahab, we need to know, right, that Abu Lahab is in hell and so is his wife. We need to know that. Great. Thank you. Um, because Allah works in mysterious ways, Chris. Well, you, you, Abu you... Lahab is mysterious as well. <laughs> I have yeah. no idea who this guy is. <laughs> That's exactly the point. It's like, 
You know, it is, for instance, when you ask Muslims, uh, which is the original tablet that's in Allah, in paradise with Allah, they'll go like, no, we don't have access to that tablet. I thought it's the same thing as, as down here on earth. Or it's the same one. Apparently not. So um, let me just bring this. So they speak here of the word bastard occurs in the Bible three times. Okay, great. I read this as Maybe well. This made me laugh. Um, have you ever heard of a, like, let me just check this, but I'm, have you ever heard of a bastard tool? There no, is a no, tool don't. that I, I used uh, growing up called a bastard tool. You use it in metalworking or so on. But the point is, is that there are perfectly valid uses of the word bastard. We, yeah. we understand it as a, as a um, swear term, you know, you're insulting someone. But there's nothing implicitly bad with that word. It just depends on the context. This is someone who using. had sex with someone out of wedlock and had a child. Yeah, right? that's what you're describing. It has negative so, connotations because we used to hold that that was a negative thing. Yeah. So so also Solomon had 4,000 stalls of horses or 40,000. Solomon had 2,000 baths or 3,000 baths. That, that really affects whether or not Jesus is the son of God, I guess. Exactly. But, None of these affect the message of scripture or any of our primary doctrines in any way. And this is and why... Just, mm. Here they've got a contradiction. When we can bring up the very same thing in the Quran, this disqualifies the Bible, but... but it, the Quran is just okay when it has exactly the same problem. Yeah, I, I think that this is, to be honest, when I see this kind of thing, uh, I think it's very immature and childish. Yeah. <laughs> so Muslims are aware that there are difficulties at the very least in their Quran, and they add context later on in time to solve that problem. Like Abu Lahab, right? Who's that? Okay, that's a bit of a weird thing. That's kind of a little bit difficult. Oh, well, we can explain that later on. You know, the Hadith comes in and they give context to it. But there are other things as well where it talks about, hey, um, you can, for example, you're told in the Quran that you're, it's not permitted for Muslims to marry polytheists. Muslims cannot marry polytheists. It's quite clear. Mm -hmm. People of the book, which includes Christians, are, to are told to stop worshipping three gods. Now, it gets the three gods wrong. Allah, Father, uh, Allah, Isa, and Miriam, and they're three separate gods. That's not what Christians have believed or ever have believed, ever. So that's wrong. Right. Anyway, ignoring that. It says that Christians are polytheists because we believe in the Trinity. Another verse says, and I believe it's Surah 5, Ayah 4, or Ayah 5, says that actually you can marry Christians. So it's like, wait, hang on. You just said you can't marry polytheists. Christians who believe in the Trinity are polytheists. You can marry Christians. How does that work? And to me, it doesn't work. <laughs> it's very confusing. You know, I raised, the confusing. Point, I raised the point with Eric. It does feel like projection. Sorry, um. The stuff does feel like projection. You know, I raised the point with Eric that I got that I got elsewhere. Um, but in the Quran, it states that Allah is like nothing in creation. Nothing in creation can be compared to him. He cannot be described in terms of anything in creation. So Allah is one. Now, when you ask a Muslim, are you one thing or are you like 50 things? No, he's, he's one thing. He's like Allah. He's one thing. You are one person. I am one person. That's one chicken over there, right? So therefore, Allah is exactly like his creation and you are exactly like Allah. But I thought Allah is totally unlike. Whereas the Trinity is bad, the Trinity is wrong, but the Trinity is completely unlike anything in creation. Exactly. That is a very good point. And I like that point. And I bring, we bring that up at Speaker's Corner. Um, they don't really have any objection to it. What's great as well is they will say, because when you unfold their logic, what they're thinking is this. God is one, the quote of Shema. And then they'll say, Father is God, the Son is God, and the Spirit is God. These are three persons, therefore there must be three gods. But what they've accidentally done there is they've implied, because in creation every person is a separate being, therefore that logic must also apply to God, because he must be like the same uh, law of creation. In other words, mm -hmm. they're saying God is just like his creation. That, that's the yeah. irony of it. But then when it talk, they talk about their religion, oh, Surah 42, Ayur 11 says that Allah is not like anything in his creation, which is funny because in that same verse, it describes him as being the one who's like all seeing and all hearing, <laughs> which they take in a literal way. So they believe he yeah, does well, actually see and he does actually hear, but he's not like anything in creation. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, we know, but I mean, there's more and more evidence that the Quran is very much derived from largely Christian texts, but it doesn't mean that these are Orthodox Christian texts. Many of these are, 
and also when you look at Islam, it's got influences from all over. It has Jewish, it has Christian, and, and mostly heretical influences. Yeah. It has, and we can tie it to Africa. We can tie it to Yemen, Southern Arabia, which has been completely ignored. I hope to have a chat with uh, Odin Lafontaine soon about that. And also he's just published his new book. I will be discussing that. I'll do something on that this weekend. Um, also, if I want to bring this up, uh, nine here. So for instance, he writes here, this is another Ahmad Didat book, another pile of trash from him. We Muslims believe that Jesus was one of the mightiest messengers of God, that he was the Christ. They'd have no idea what the Christ is. No clue. And he was born miraculously without any male intervention, which many modern day Christians do not believe today. Well, if you, you're not a Christian, if you don't believe that. So exactly. like Paul Williams, he takes the same tack, but also he, he basically undermines the entire concept of Jesus as God in this particular book, which is Desert Storm, Has It Ended Christ in Islam? That's, I don't know. <laughs> that is a weird, yeah, I wasn't expecting that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, this is, it's, it's just your average Tuesday in Islam. <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs> So he undermines the whole concept of Jesus here. And then this one I found really offensive. Um, he says, who moved the stone? And here he puts together the whole resurrection narrative. Right, right. right. And this is one of his, this is really an offensive book to me. Um, so yeah, he has sold, not sold, given away thousands and thousands of copies. As a South African, I'm quite ashamed of the man because he was South African from India though. Uh -huh. And um, this is weird. I saw this as well. Please obtain a Bible in that language for the biblical quotations and do not try a freehand translation on your own. You're worried that Muslims are going to translate the Bible on their own? Yeah, no. I don't know. It just seems weird. But so, yeah, he speaks here of now, he talks about. Now, he talks about this. Um, this is very interesting. Uh, I'll cover this another time in more detail. But he speaks of Mr. Frank Morrison, a prominent Bible scholar. Now, I dare all of you to run out and go and read about Mr. Frank Morrison, the prominent Bible scholar. I've got some notes elsewhere. I'll cover this another time. But you're going to discover that just maybe. Do you think, Chris, there's a tiny, tiny microscopic percentage that Frank Morrison isn't a prominent Bible scholar? Well, I mean, the fact that he's referred to as Mr. Frank Morrison. So that does that mean that he hasn't got a PhD? He's not part of academia? I don't know. He's, he's uh, a bit of a hack journalist. I mean, so... Oh, he's a journalist. I've got, I've got a bunch of notes connect, collected on Frank Morrison, which I had I had a bunch of notes connect, collected on Frank Morrison for discussion at the time. But it's really... I mean, Frank Morrison basically is just a... He just writes whatever comes into his head, Right. And so who moved the stone? And he says, we are left therefore with the problem of the vacant tomb unsolved. So the guy's like an amateur detective. He's like, he's like Laurel and Hardy, you know, instead of the Hardy boys, he comes across more as Laurel and Hardy. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> okay. Joseph of Arimathea secretly removed the body to a more suitable resting place. Right. So he goes on and he really works hard at undermining the claims here. So for instance, he goes, he has this really bad, he talks about, Masi, okay? So he says, okay, let's do this portion. Why did she go to the tomb? Why, why did Mary Magdalene go to the tomb? The gospel writers say that she went to anoint him. The Hebrew word for anoint is masaha, which means to rub or to massage or to anoint. The word and its meaning are the same in the Arabic language. From this root word masaha, we get the Arabic word masi in the Hebrew messiah, both meaning the same thing. The anointed one which is translated into Greek as Christos, from which we derive the word Christ. Do Jews massage dead bodies after three days? Anoint, it can mean to rub, to massage, to anoint, the anointed one. Do Jews massage dead bodies after three days? No. Do Muslims massage dead bodies after three days? No. Do Christians massage dead bodies after three days? No. It is common knowledge that within three hours after death, rigor mortis sets in the breaking up of the body cells, the hardening of the body. In such three days, the corpse starts rotting from within. If we massage such, such a rot, rotting body, it will fall to pieces. She oh, went there to man. massage him. 
She gave him a massage. This uh, this dead guy needs a massage. Let me do that. <laughs> Does it make sense that Mary Magdalene wants to massage a rotting body after three days? So let me see. You had to rub, to massage, to anoint. And he's like, she went there to massage the guy. That's what you do with dead bodies. <laughs> wow. Um, wow. You know what? I, I, I've heard something oh, really, by the way, this really is dumb. interesting. It makes no yeah. sense unless we confess that she was looking for a live Jesus to massage him. <laughs> So according to him, she's like, hey, you know what? I get the impression I need to give a massage. <laughs> I need to go right now. <laughs> that, that makes no sense. It's bizarre. It's 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 the it's the um the ponderings of someone who, to be honest with you, you would question their cognitive ability if they told you this. Gosh. Yeah. Gosh, it, it's desperate. You know, it, it goes against all scholarship. You know, most scholars, no matter how critical they are, will accept that there was a person who was known as Jesus of Nazareth, and who who died, um, who was uh, convicted by Pontius Pilate, judged by Pontius Pilate, and um, yeah. and sentenced to death. You know, people like all scholars agree with this. Basically, you'd be extremely fringe if you didn't, and you would have to explain why there are references um, in extra biblical material. Flavius Josephus uh, in Tacitus, you know, you'd have to explain why that is there. And it's bizarre, really bizarre. Actually, you know, someone brought up something very interesting here about um, open, hold on, folders. Let me do this. Uh, someone brought up something, this, this comment, and according to Islam, the god of Kutam was a demon called the White. Um, do you, you know the story about Muhammad's name is supposedly Kutam, right? I don't know if you're I've familiar with that it. story. I'm not. I'm, I haven't done like a deep dive into it, but I've heard of it before. Um, let me find something. Um, so Muhammad sacrificed to a white ewe, right? Muhammad sacrificed a white ewe to. Um, actually, let me go back up. Let me find this. Uh, uh, let me go. I'll have to go to the top again, just just so that everyone knows that the idea of whiteness is actually well connected with Muhammad. Right, let me just do that. So there's a few things. The white elephant. So the elephant that supposedly attacked Mecca was a white elephant. Right. So the you know when 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 the elephants came, the year of the elephant is when Muhammad was born, and that elephant was supposedly a white elephant. Just so, by the way, and the name of the elephant was Mahmud. It was a female elephant called Mahmud, which is, mm. and um, Wakidi Al Wakidi gives a tradition that there were thirteen elephants with the army, besides the famous one called Mahmud. And Mahmud the elephant refused to go into Mecca. So when it, every time Mahmud faced Mecca, Mahmud would lie down, right? And um, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it was a white elephant. That's what they were alluding to. Yeah. Yes, and so we draw attention to a more conclusive instance of Muhammad's association with an with ancient pagan worship. We are given the words of a confession from his own lips that in his younger days he had sacrificed a white ewe to Al Uzza, right? By Yakut Al Hamawi. Oopsie. In the article on Al Uzza in his geographical dictionary, says the prophet has made mention of her Al Uzza one day and said, why? I made an offering of a reddish white ewe to Al Uzza when I was following the religion of my people. Now the Jews have this thing about the red heifers, right? So you've got a reddish white ewe. But let's continue with that. But that's that's in my monotheism series. Now I want to have a look at this. And since this guy brought this up, let me just take that away, take away his comment. Al Abiyad, the Lord of Monday and the moon. Now the Monday is heavily connected to Islam. Right, it, there's a very heavy connection historically, theologically, is to Islam. So Murah al Abiyad, Jinn king of Monday and the moon, the white demon. So Murah al Abiyad, the white one, the father of the light, or the father of light. Aba al Nur, or Mara, the white king. So Nur. Now everyone says Nur is the light of Allah, right? The Nur, right? Except the Nur is not. Sunlight. Nur specifically means moonlight. It's a different oh, okay. word for sunlight. So the nur is moonlight, light of the moon. So it's you now we're talking about moon worship. And the white king, the Malik al-Abiyad, is Lord of Monday and the Moon, Kamar. 
So it is reported from Atta that Ibn Abbas said a devil called Al-Abiyad came to the Prophet in the form of Jibreel and cast these words, the satanic verses upon him, and the Prophet recited them. And this guy just mentioned that that according to another tradition, he worshipped Al-Abiyad. And Al-Abiyad is said to be closest to Satan in his court. And so you want to conjure him to serve you, okay? Now, this is from a website online where someone says, if you want to summon Al-Abiyad, fast 40 days for the sake of Allah, abstain from all meat products and byproducts. After the obligatory prayer, you must recite the Qasam 100 times and then recite Surah Al-Jinn three times. The incense are this, this one. So you have to have Oud and Azuk and so on. And on the last day, recite the conjuration with the incense until he comes with his army. The King Abiyad will assist all your needs after making an agreement with you. This is how to summon in Islamic magic, to summon the demon Ab Abiyad. Wow. Yeah, just, just in reference to you. Yeah, and Muhammad received his first revelation on a Monday. He, I mean, you've got to go through the whole list. It's weird how much Monday and the, the connotations with the moon and such things. The gates of paradise are flung open on Monday and Thursday, but there's that's that's the least of it. There's a whole bunch of stuff where there's connections to Mondays. Yeah, and um, I wanted to also show the audience. So look, this book, by the way, so that just the audience knows, this is the combat kit. Oops, my... Here we go. The combat kit against Bible thumpers, linked in the description box. Right, the combat kit. Then there's I this one. I can't recommend it, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, <I> just... <laughs> Desert Storm Has It Ended, Christ in Islam, where he talks about Christ in Islam. You might find this. Christian Muslim responses, debate on TV, right? Um, he's talking about South African broadcast television here. Uh, the chairman, Mr. Bill Chalmers, I think it can be said that there's at present somewhat more accommodation on the Islamic side for the founder of Christianity than there is on the Christian side for the founder of Islam. What the significance of that is, I'll leave it to you, the viewer, to determine but I do think you will agree that it is a good thing that we are talking together. Yeah, fine. Yeah, great. Okay, apologies for Islam there. Then I've shown you this one about, about who moved the stone, where they give you the whole the swoon theory and a whole bunch of other theories by this. And that they mention here Dr. Hugh J. Schoenfield, one of the world's leading Bible scholars. Yeah, go look up these names. Go look up what these people believe. Okay, let, me, let me bring this up. So... So, for instance, the gospel writers do not say that she went to anoint him. The gospels mention women such as Mary Magdalene going to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body after his crucifixion, but they do not state that the purpose was to anoint him in the sense of anointing him as the Messiah. Right? So the word for anoint is masaha, which means to rub. However, the, the connection made between this root word and the Arabic word masi is not entirely accurate. The term Messiah in the Hebrew scriptures refers to someone who is anointed a king or priest by God. Right. And the Greek word. So they, they just they just mentioned some inaccuracies here. And then so I just that's not. Hold on. Let me see if I got anything here. Um, OK. <clears throat> um, on this point, I just well, the 21st century's greatest enemy of Christian scholarship, Bart Ehrman, has dismissed the Passover plot as a fraud. Now, Ahmed Didat is here referencing a book called The Passover Plot. OK. So Bart Ehrman has strongly rejected and criticized the Passover plot theory proposed. Hold on, let me do this. So he's saying great biblical scholar, Hugh Schoenfield. Okay. This guy wrote a bunch of garbage trash. So let me pull this up. Bart Ehrman has strongly rejected and criticized the Passover plot theory proposed by Hugh Schoenfield, which suggests that Jesus faked his own death and resurrection. Here are the key points. He argued that the Passover plot reconstruction events has almost precisely nothing to do with the historical analysis presented in his book, How Jesus Became God. Ehrman takes great care to distance himself from the Passover plot, calling it offensive to suggest that, that he, Bart Ehrman, is, is regurgitating or breathlessly presenting that thesis as a brilliant new discovery. Nowhere in the book does he claim the resurrection was invented by Jesus hallucinating disciples. Now we go back to that Jesus, the disciples were on drugs. Yeah, right. there's, a, there's an interesting theory. point. Yeah. There's um, I, I, from what I've heard, there hasn't been a case that's been documented of two people hallucinating about the same thing at the same yeah. time in uni in unison, like like yeah. separately, basically. Um, yeah. so the idea that all of them separately had the same hallucinations, seeing the same things, confirming the same events is 
Like you, you won't find that occurring in reality. Yeah. So basically, Bart Ehrman rejects this because Ahmadirat is here using Hugh Schoenfeld's Passover plot. Now, the, the short version is that Jesus said, hey, guys, you know what I'll do? I'm going to fake my death. So what we do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get crucified, right? Then I'm going to fake my death and you guys bring me down. You heal me up. Three days later, I'm going to appear in public. Everything will be hunky-dory. I'll be alive and everyone's going to think I'm the Messiah. What Jesus didn't count on was that the, the Roman soldier would stab him in the side and kill him. That's the Passover plot. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get a crown of thorns put on. I'm gonna get whipped, beaten, carry a cross through the street, get you know get completely just just, just demolished. Then oh, I'm gonna get hung up on the cross death. for three days. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, like crucifixion. Ultimately, you die of suffocation because you like because I read up about exactly what crucifixion involves. The, like when you get pierced through what is most likely your wrists. What happens is in order to sustain breathing, you have to put weight on your own arms and push yourself up. And then when right. you do that, you can breathe a little bit. And then you, and it's agony to do that. So you let go. And, but now you can't breathe right. So you have to push up again. So eventually you'll keep sustaining yourself by pushing on your own arms and wrists, which is painful because there's nails in between them. But um, right. eventually you'll give up. And then when you do that, you just suffocate to death. You know, I mean, the, the people that try yep. and say Jesus survived this, I think, are. Uh, how like how how does that even make sense um it, it's, it's on the same theory as you know jesus had a secret twin that no one knew but just like came in right before jesus he lived in japan and had a kid yeah all of those yeah this, this kind of thing um yeah it doesn't yeah. it doesn't properly explain the evidence and the and the data so it needs to be dismissed yeah. the only explanation um, i think is the resurrection i think that is the strongest case yeah, that's that simple. So the mushroom cult idea is there's a new twist on the mushroom cult being pushed today. There's a guy that's now Dr. Amon something or other. Basically, I don't know, apparently he's a Satanist, whatever, but he's supposedly a scholar. He's now claiming that the word Christ, because the Greek words can have multiple meanings, just like Arabic words can have up to 30 meanings. So the word can also mean like a medication that you rub on your eye. So he's claiming now, this Amon Hillman is now claiming that Christ means, now he's, he makes different claims, but Christ means it is a drug that you place in your eyes and it opens your eyes so you can see the truth. So Christ is actually a drug that the, that, that the apostles were taking or something of this nature. <laughs> okay. Okay. Weird. Yeah, this is like the new thing that, that's popular now. But also, Schoenfield, the great Christian scholar, right? The great biblical scholar, Schoenfield, right? So, Ahmadita is quoting this great biblical scholar, Schoenfield. Schoenfield believes that Jesus was not divine, nor the Son of God, but was used as a, as a crutch, invented by the fledging church to have a human embodiment of a deity. That's Christian 101. Jesus himself would see his deification as blasphemous. Jesus came to believe he was the expected Messiah of Israel after immersing himself in Old Testament tradition. So he was deluded. He plotted and schemed. So he thought he was the Messiah of Israel, and he, and he, but he thought his deification would be blasphemous. Sure. Jesus plotted and schemed to fulfill the Messianic prophecies, believing it was imposed upon him through the demands of the Old Testament. He did not believe himself to be divine, despite the New Testament claims. The Gospels are corrupted legends and traditions written after AD 100 by a Gentile offshoot of Jesus' original Jewish followers. The Gospels are inconsistent, late, and have many inaccuracies. The New Testament was written after AD 100, despite evidence to the contrary. His resurrection was not a divine event, but rather a human plot to revive him after his supposed death. Jesus orchestrated his own crucifixion and resurrection with the help of a few assistants, intending to be revived after his death and then assume his rightful place as Messiah. He never intended to actually die on the cross, but planned to be drugged into unconsciousness briefly before being removed from the cross. The Roman soldier's spear pierced his heart, ensuring death before he was removed from the cross. So he didn't yeah. die on the cross, but he died on the cross. And Schoenfeld's arguments are just a bunch of trash. It's just that that's well, what I mean, Ahmadita study stuff. It just looks like this typical stuff you'd find on like an atheist forum board on the internet. Like, in all honesty, yes. you know, the whole, oh, the gospels are super late. It's like, but no scholar believes this. Like, well, you're going against all scholars. You know, the New Testament wasn't written until 100 AD. Okay, well, we, some of the, like, uh, the book of Galatians could be dated as early as like 50 AD, if not around that yeah. time. Exactly. It, it makes, I mean, it, it doesn't even make, how do you, oh, okay, there's so much that's wrong with that. <laughs> My head's going to explode. 
Yeah, yeah these so this is Dr. Hugh Schoenfeld. Right, okay. And he's one of the world's leading Bible scholars, right? Yeah, and that's what right. Ahmad did. So. Sure. And then the last one I want to bring up um, is this one, because I, I showed it to you guys, and I was hoping you guys would do an analysis. You, you and your team would do an analysis of it. But this one is called Version 2 in Defense of Islam, right? And this is a book that they hope everyone will use that will, they will use this and use this book for Dawah. So it provides, uh, you had a brief look at it, your thoughts on this. I mean, because are the Dawah, are the Dawah guys all trained and scripted? Because they seem to be heavily scripted. Yeah, I'm pretty sure most of it comes <laughs> orally though. Like they, they hear it rather than they read it. Uh, most of them probably can't read, <laughs> but honestly, it, it comes through them hearing what they are told by other supposed experts or sheikhs or imams or da'is, and they just regurgitate it. Um, so it's the same kind of arguments. Uh, yeah, that's that's basically what it is. They they go through like phases and they rehash stuff as well. So it's like it's like a cycle. They start mm -hmm. off with I don't know. Um, the prophets are all sinless, but the Bible says they committed sins. So the Bible can't be true. And then it'll be like, oh, actually, no. What we really mean to say is the prophets did embarrassing things, and that can't be possible. That can't be true. And then people reject. Uh, people show well, that's wrong, and they show that Islam has actually that same issue. And then it'll jump to why was Jesus baptized? If baptism is for the remission of sins, then you'll answer that Matthew three fifteen to answer that. And then it'll jump to something else. And then finally, it'll make its way all the way back to. Oh yeah, the prophets are sinless, and <laughs> and they just they just go about in the same sort of cycle it goes back of, uh, in a circle, yeah. Because they they can't really do much. Um, innovation is very hard to do. They somewhat try, but remember in Islam, um, kalam speculative theology is hugely discouraged among most groups. So mm -hmm. there's a ve and there's a limit, and they're not really supposed to claim to have more knowledge than the companions of Muhammad did. But the companions of Muhammad didn't weren't great philosophical thinkers, so they they didn't they, they didn't address anything. Like they would just stay away from certain topics and say um, Allah knows best, or what they would say would be incredibly problematic. Yeah, they were not and systematic theologians. And, they're not. No, yeah. they. You know, I mean, Allah has body parts. Well, we affirm this, but we can't explain how or why. But we really do think he has body parts. It's okay. Yeah. Like so, your God has parts then. <laughs> your god has composition with real existing physical body parts right you know yeah so so for the audience this is in the description box you can download this have a look at some of the arguments they use in some cases they discuss some of these topics and others they link to online websites they link to youtube videos as references so you can see what it is that they use in their defense of islam the resources that they send other people to so this might help you in terms of your understanding, right? Um, Can you find that? Do you remember in the meeting we I found that uh, that image and it had like all the uh, supposed writers of the Gospels and New Testament on one side and all of the writers for the Quran on the other, and they were like for the Quran it, it was book? just like tons. I was think it in this so. Book? In volume two, right? if you just like briefly scan through it until you see a big image, it's like a blue image. Um, uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, we can bring that up as uh... no blue. There we go. I think my no, not this one. Mm, no, not quite. If I remember right, it like takes up the whole page. There we go. This there we go. Yes, yeah, yes, this yeah. one. Okay. Actually, this is a good point. We can sort of wind down on this one. We can finish up on this one. Just so that people have a, have a few references to Islamic polemics, and then they, they know what it is they're dealing with. Yeah. So this what are the issues is, with Okay. This is, um, this is kind of hilarious because it's a bit of a self-owned. I don't know why the author who put together this, uh, this Dawa script has decided to make this, but they're basically trying to say, look, the New Testament, we don't know who wrote this, which is not true at all. And then on the other hand, when it when they come to who wrote the Quran, he writes <laughs> a ton of different people, which I think in his mind makes it seem that the Quran is more plausible because it has more authors. But that doesn't do what he wants it to do. That actually just calls into question who wrote the Quran. 
Because remember, Muslims will, and this happens in the park, but it's kind of funny now because people have kind of popularized a response to this. Muslims will say, who wrote the Gospel of Matthew? And, and then they'll lead up to who is Matthew and so on and so forth. And you could just say, well, who wrote Surah al-Baqarah? Who wrote chapter two of the Quran? And the issue for them is that they don't have an actual tradition that tells them that. They have a tradition that tells them who compiled the Quran. They have a mm -hmm. tradition of people who memorized the Quran, but they don't have a tradition of who specifically wrote it. Because so in other words, when it was compiled, yeah. Zaid ibn Tabat had to collect all of the various surahs from different scribes and different memorizers yeah. and then have them written down. So someone had to write down the original copy. Yes, someone had to write down. And so each surah or each chapter of the Quran was written by somebody. Exactly. But we don't know who. <laughs> so you see how right. that massively backfires for them. And this, so, and this is so kind you, of admitting that they're going like, no, no, go on, go on. You finish first. I, I was just going to say, like, so what they're doing here, sort of low key, is he, for the Quran, here are all the possible people who could have contributed to it in some way. That's what they're saying. Well, they're literally they saying, here are all source. the different authors. Wow. They, at least they give a source, I guess. History but, of I mean, the Quranic like, text. Yeah. yeah. It's not like, oh, you know, we can trace it down to, I don't know, four people or something. It's No, no, no. It's a huge list of possible people who may have contributed in some way to the Quran. We don't know but exactly But the Quran is supposed to be a single text, whereas the, the Bible is many, many books. Yeah, exactly that. Written over um, centuries. I don't know why they wrote the New Testament. That's that's kind of weird. If, you, if you're contrasting it with the Quran, surely you'd write Bible. But for some reason, he's just picked the New Testament, which is also weird because... So who is this guy and what did he write? Who is Amr bin Fuhaira? Who is Talha? Who is he and what did he write? Mundir, Mugira, Mu'atib. Who is he and what did he write? Exactly. He wrote the Quran? Who, he well, was he described, wrote maybe okay. some part of it, but we don't know which part. Maybe like, what, and for all we know, like, um, let's have a look at a guy. Uh, let's pick, yeah, Ubay ibn Kab's there. So Ubay ibn Kab could have wrote like 90% of the Quran and all the other guys just contributed to that last 10%. For all we know, maybe Zayed bin Tabit, who was a scribe of uh, Muhammad, maybe he wrote 90% of it. We, we, we have his no idea. Zayed ibn Tabit, do you see his name? I don't see his name. Yeah, there is. Zayed uh, is in the middle on the second uh, second row, second column. Zayed bin Tabit, they call him here. Sometimes it's Zayed bin Tabit, sometimes it's Zayed bin Tabit. There you go, yeah. Okay, there you go. Yeah. You're right. So he is there. At least they got that right. At least he he's involved in the um the compilation of it. And supposedly he wrote some of it down. But how much and where? We don't know. Are there any supporting the historical ones. writings or archaeology? No. The oldest Islamic manuscripts are late. And those that are the, the oldest ones are very, very different. They will claim otherwise. I've seen I read a paper recently, a week ago, I read a paper on comparing the the Birmingham and the Sunnah and the guy claims they are 98.917% identical or some some random story of that type you tell me but then of course the Sunnah is two manuscripts it's the palimpsest so it's got the underlayer and the overlayer so yeah you look at that and that's you know there's some differences um, just to add real the, quick as well yeah. sorry to jump in in the palimpsest of the Sunnah manuscript surah 9 ayah 8 of 5 is missing it's just not there. Yeah. And notice, true, and they will claim, though, that refuting, um, they will claim here there are no missing or added verses in the Quran. So you've just made that point. They have their own refutations here. So subchapter 1, right, section 3, subchapter 1, page 42. So what? So for those of you who do polemics online, I want you to think about your arguments and see if they have a refutation in this text, for instance. This one in version two, Defense of Islam, link in the description. So you can have a look at that and see how they deal with that. You can look at the resources that they use. And this may have been updated since then, who knows? But this is this is one that is common that they give out to other Muslims. So understand these guys are organized, they're trained, they they all come off, they all sing off the same hymn sheet. And we don't really do that. So yeah, and then a cool, like Philip, uh, just to answer that question. So um when the 1924 Quran was canonized, it took 17 years, and the scholars at Al-Azhar utilized a theological tradition. They took 
the the historical tradition, but they did not use any ancient texts at all. And they didn't have any with money Quran to compare to. They simply picked one of the kira'at. They didn't even go to one of the main readers. They went to a student of one of the main readers. And that particular student, uh, this being Hafs, he's got, he's got multiple contested variants of his own ver variant of the Quran. So they claimed that he was an authentic. Um, so he was a student of one of the main readers and he wrote it down authentically and accurately. But we know there's at least four different variants of his own version. Now, don't forget, half, for, for every reader, you have two students. So there, for everyone who was an authentic reader of the Quran or canonized version of the Quran, there are two students who have received that transmission and have recorded that transmission. So Hafs doesn't agree with the other student and Hafs doesn't even agree with himself. Would that be fairly accurate, Chris? Yeah, yeah completely. I'm still baffled by how that's even possible. Yeah. But somehow it is. Yeah. So yeah, I should probably call it a night here. I just wanted to to sort of introduce some of the sources, discuss some of the arguments, the polemics, and the um, and just show people through these books where these where these ideas and arguments came from, and where the, the just the bad sources and the people that they appeal to. I mean, they appeal to some of the worst possible sources, the most ridiculously stupid sources, and they 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 pump them up and claim that they're scholars when they're not. They claim that they are you know great. I mean, this guy's heretical. Bluntly, Schoenfeld is just absolutely heretical he's he's as bad as dan brown if not worse so you know th that's what we're dealing with as authentic biblical scholarship now apparently as defined by islam no yeah as defined by by islam and muslims yeah so guys i should call it a night here any any final words from you chris any thoughts from you no this has been this has been really good um i'm not too surprised by a lot of the stuff in the ahmed ddap uh instruction manuals uh, the desert storm thing still makes me still makes me laugh. Yeah, it's it's the same kind of stuff we hear at the speaker's corner, but in different forms. Um, it's it's all the same kind of nonsense that they come up with, but it's easy to are refute. We, so, are we effective? I mean, are we pushing back hard? Are, they, are we starting to undermine their their faith in their in their stories? Are we starting to yes. to make them desperate? Yes. Well, I mean, we'll put it this way: there's now an embargo an unspoken embargo on pretty much all Christians who are frequent goers to Speaker's Corner. Um, David, who's, like, as an example, is a very talented speaker at Speaker's Corner, a very yeah. talented debater. He knows a lot about Islam, and we've been going through some stuff in the weekly apologetics meetings, and he is completely blacklisted. Um, he now has to constantly approach Muslim debaters, I mean, debaters in the loosest sense, because they don't debate anymore, and say, hey, I want to challenge you on the Quran. You, I want you to defend your Quran. And they'll say, look, we'll defend Christianity as well. We'll be fair, but I want you to defend your Quran. And they go, nope, nope, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to run away. Um, and that's the state of play. Uh, it, it's, it's a real shame. Speaker's Corner is a place of debate, but the Muslims there, who still make up the majority, or that, that is slowly, slowly changing, I think, they can't debate. So they're retreating. Yes. Because we've learned all the you, tricks. You'll know it well. Some of them actually go at the outside of the park and they wait there and they give evangelism there to random people who walk by. Basically, there's like an entrance, and Muslims mm -hmm. often stay there and they talk to unexpecting uh, visitors and try to convert them there. But the actual yeah. inside the park, um, there are still a few, but they basically go in their own little corner and they don't want people to go outside that corner. Yeah. I mean, they, they tackle people with no knowledge, they tackle newbies it's it's obvious i mean yeah i mean it's they they're not desperate to to talk with me about the sharia for instance you know yeah it does make know what happen. so look guys learn your enemy's playbook study his playbook i've shown you the links are in the description i've shown you where they get some of these arguments from download those have a look through those look at your polemics and look at their refutations study their refutations and learn how to pick them apart learn how to counter their counters i, I think that would be important um, would you agree with that chris yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really good point. Really good point to to do exactly that. Yeah. So, guys, thank you very much. Um, that that's it from me tonight. I uh, yeah appreciate the time that you've you've been on, Chris. Um, for the we had over one hundred and ten people at one point, so that's really nice. really great. Yeah, um, likewise. Yes. Um, it's always a pleasure to be here and uh, have a chat. Yeah. No, thank you. I, I really appreciate this. Hopefully, the audience has 
good material to go away with, to do some of their own analysis, improve their apologetics, improve their polemics. And we've got some new arguments. Talk about Allah is just like his, his creation. Allah is one single thing. God is not. Isn't God unlike anything in creation? You know, think questions. Ask. We've got to ask the hard questions and put them on the back foot. They've got nothing to stand on. I mean, really, I, don't, I think these people have, it's, Islam is just the biggest, most amazingly successful con job in history. Yes. Yeah. And it's real that it affects people's salvation. It really, and that's a, that's a sad thing about it. There are so many people who are trapped inside Islam. They can't leave because then they feel like they're abandoning their family. They're abandoning their history. And also there's a real threat of them being killed because of it in many places of the world. So they do. That's yeah, but that's changing now. The, the ex-Muslim movement shows that this is slowly changing. Things are changing. Absolutely, yeah. So yeah. all of the arguments, we are taking them apart, speak to people, tell people. I have people contact me on a regular basis that, that my arguments are getting through to their wives, to their son, to their daughter, to their priest. <laughs> you know, they're talking <laughs> about these things. They're actually approaching their priest and saying, hold on, that was wrong about Islam. And can we, have, can we sit down and have a talk about this? And they've got evidence to show him because they were well prepared by going through my arguments, my notes, my and showing them evidence, showing the priest authoritative sources. And they say, look, things, people tell me things are changing, things are improving, that they're starting to be effective in their communities, in their circles. So guys, you can do it too. All of us have our part to play. Absolutely. Yeah. So guys, thank you. Yeah. Um, so guys, we could be a whole night, so I need to end it here. But thank you very much, Chris, for the time. It's been a pleasure, been a real privilege. And I'm no sure we'll chat again way. soon. You said you were very busy, so thank you for taking the time out. So, guys, have a great day, have wherever you are in the world, and um, God bless. See you soon. Take care. God bless. Bye.